Okay, have you heard of the name Samuel Rutherford uh, before? Have you heard the name Samuel Rutherford? Uh, Samuel Rutherford was a man who was famous really for a couple of reasons. Uh, Samuel Rutherford uh, was one of the delegates at the Westminster Assembly. So you know that whole Westminster Confession of Faith thing that we keep banging on about? Well, Samuel Rutherford was one of the dudes that was involved in the writing of this, although they are seldom referred to as dudes. And there's another reason that Samuel Rutherford was famous. Samuel Rutherford was famous for the many letters that Rutherford wrote throughout his life. So do you see the idea? Many, many Christians, Reformed believers over the years have really cherished uh, the letters that Rutherford wrote. Why? Well, yes, because these letters demonstrated a lot of theological understanding, but it's more than that. Those letters that he wrote, they demonstrated real pastoral warmth. Okay, so Rutherford didn't just write letters. Rutherford very often wrote to despairing Christians and downcast Christians. And why did he write? He wrote simply to encourage them. Now, as I stand here in front of you this evening, I am very much aware that some in the room might be wishing they could receive something like that. That there's some in the room tonight who, to be frank, are spiritually downcast and despairing. Isn't that right? Some in here feel like they've lost the love they had at first, or they feel that they've lost sight of the power of prayer. There's some in here who feel just under pressure from family, under pressure from finances, under pressure from work. Well, I good news to start with. Because do you know what happens when we come to this section of Scripture? Do you know what it's like tonight? It's like you are opening an envelope this evening. That's what we're doing tonight at LCPC. You're opening an envelope. And what do you find? You open it, you pull it out, and you find a letter that's written to you. And it's a letter. As you begin to read it, it's a letter of encouragement. But wait for it, because this is the best part of it. This is a letter we find to you from the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that a staggering thing to begin with? That God loves you Christians so much that what he does is he writes a letter to you, and it's a letter to encourage your heart. Isn't that exciting? Now, before we get to the reasons that Christ gives you here to be encouraged in the Christian walk, before we get to the reasons he gives you to encourage, what I think we need to do is we need to think a little bit more about the context of this letter. So this is actually the plan this evening. So we're going to do our usual thing of three points, okay? We're going to do that in a minute or two, and those three points are going to be a little bit shorter than normal. Okay, maybe that's music to your ears. I don't know. But we'll get to those three points in a minute. Before we get there, what I want to do is throw at you three introductory details about this letter. So everyone got it? It's three and three, isn't it? So three points in a moment or two, shorter points. But before we get there, three introductory details about this letter. Okay, everyone's with me, yeah? We got it? So what are we, you, you've got Revelation 3 open in front of you from verse 7. Everyone's got that there? So what are we dealing with in Revelation chapter 3? Well, in the sermon series, I'm right in saying that we've been working our way through the churches of Asia in, what did I say the last time? It was a, an N-shaped root. Isn't that right? We started off in the south in Ephesus. Then we went north, Sardis. We went a bit over that way to Thyatira, Pergamum. And tonight we find ourselves about 30 miles southeast of Sardis in a place called, do you see it? We're in a place called Philadelphia. Okay, Philadelphia. Now, I could definitely be, I could go on and on, wax lyrical about Philadelphia, the city, okay, and give you information about that. You know, if we had loads of time we wanted to do, I could tell you, but obviously it's the city of brotherly love, isn't it? And we could talk about the fact that it was plagued by earthquakes, and it was a city that changed its name, and we could, we could go on and on, but you are not caring about that in a sense. What's our concern? We're not so much caring about the city, but we're caring about the church in the city, aren't we? 
And this is the first detail that I want you to get, the first introductory detail. See the believers that we're dealing with in this place. They were weak. They were weak believers. Now, what am I talking about? Have a look at verse 8. Come on, let's look at it together. Verse 8. Isn't that a really strange phrase that you see? What does Jesus say about these Philadelphian brethren? He says, what? That they have little power. Okay, you with me? That's quite a strange phrase, isn't it? So what does it mean that these Philadelphian Christians... Little, well, it could be, I think, could be a social statement and that maybe there weren't too many influencers, you know, Instagram influencers in the Philadelphian church, right? Maybe it's a social statement. They don't have very much power. It could be that. It could be an economic statement as well couldn't it? That maybe despite the fact that Philadelphia was a commercial center, maybe some of that money hadn't kind of trickled down to the people of God. So maybe they say, do you know what? I think almost definitely it's a numeric statement that with the Philadelphian church being a really new church, don't imagine it as this big, bustling, mega metropolis type church. No, perhaps just a small group of believers And I think absolutely certainly it is a spiritual statement, this little power. Because by the very atmosphere of this text, you can see that they're downhearted. It makes sense, doesn't it? Why else would Jesus Christ write to encourage a group of Christians unless they were discouraged? You see? So they are weak. They're of little power. Okay, let me give you a second introductory detail about these Philadelphian believers. And that is that they were also oppressed. They were oppressed. How can I make that statement? We can make it generally, can't we? Because Jesus Christ writes these seven letters to churches in Asia that were facing persecution. So we can make a general statement that these believers were facing some sort of opposition. So that's a general statement I can make quite easily. But can we not actually tie it down? Can we not make it specific? If you look at verse 9, have a look at verse 9. Look at that phrase. You've seen this phrase. Do you see it? Christ speaks of the synagogue of Satan. Doesn't he? Does that ring any bells, people? Synagogue of Satan. We saw that in one of the churches in chapter 2, didn't we? Wasn't it the same thing? Smyrna? So here in Philadelphia, just as in Smyrna, what's happening? What's going on in this town here? The Jews are opposing the Christians, perhaps ridiculing the Christians, almost certainly encouraging the Romans in their persecution of Christians. Now let me take a breath. I nearly choked to death a moment ago, but let me just take a breath for a moment. What are you thinking right now? Now, come on, if you're with me and engaging in this, like, you can just have a look around. And I speak to you, what was it about a church that wasn't a bustling place and like a small church in a city? And we look around here, what are you thinking? Or I talk about a church that's facing difficulty from the prevailing culture. We look around London. Well, what were you thinking? You're just thinking the same as you've been thinking all the way through Revelation, all these letters. You could be thinking, right? This sounds amazingly familiar to us. I could camp out in that like we've done in other sermons. We could linger on that. I do not want to do that. I want to throw at you a third introductory detail because look at the end of verse 8. This is important to get about these Christians. Look at the end of verse 8. What does Jesus do? What does he praise them? He praises them for not denying his name. That despite the fact that they're struggling, you know, they're weak and they're lacking in power and they are oppressed. These are the people who are faithful. I mean, it's actually, I think it's four times. It's a short letter. Like if you got a letter like this through the letterbox, like this is a short letter. And yet four times Jesus Christ is saying, praising them for their faithfulness, for standing firm. And maybe even that is of encouragement to you this evening. Because are you one of the people that I spoke about a moment ago? Are you a Christian who is low and discouraged and perhaps full of doubt? Is, is, is that you? Do you not see what Christ is saying to us here? Surely he's saying, keep on keeping on, Christian. Stand 
firm. Do not deny the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep on keeping on. So we get the scene. We've got an idea about Philadelphia, do we? So it's a, a, a poor, powerless congregation facing opposition. Okay, let's get to it. Let's, here's the big question of the evening. How does the Lord Jesus Christ encourage this church? How does Jesus Christ encourage these believers? Well, what he does in this letter is Jesus reminds the Philadelphians and he reminds us of three crucial truths. Three things, three truths. Here's the first one. He reminds them, you. He reminds us of the administrator of salvation. The administrator of salvation. That's the first heading. Um, As most of you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was not here. And a couple of weeks ago, I was um, up in a town, no, not a town, a village, indeed, called Ullapool, uh, on the west coast of Scotland. It's the village at the end of the world, (laughs) if you've never been there. Um, And I was invited there to speak as part of the communion weekend or communion season uh, at Alipo Free Church, which is a big deal. And um, on the Friday evening, as part of the whole series of festivities, uh, they had a special event at Alipo Free Church. And I think largely prompted by the minister, Lackey McDonald, there was a lot of food at this uh, event, lots of curries, like 10 different curries, lots of cakes, the whole works. And I was asked uh, to speak at this, and I was asked, um, basically it was, Andy, will you give your testimony at the end when everyone's had lots and lots of food and they're feeling sleepy? Can you talk and can you uh, give your testimony? Okay, now, I'll be honest with you and that I do like um, giving my testimony. I haven't done it a lot in the last few years, but I love giving my testimony, not because I get to speak about myself. Um, No, I love giving my testimony because it's that opportunity for me to to heart back to the very first time that the Lord Jesus Christ showed me by His grace something of His glory. You know, I, I get the opportunity to give my testimony. I can look back and look back to the first time, by the work of the Holy Spirit, I saw something of the majesty and the glory of the Lord Jesus and who he really was. And you see that idea of hearken back to, the, to you know, a recognition of the glory of Christ. Do you not agree with me that that is part of these letters in Revelation? Because I think every single week that we've been gathered and looking at Revelation, I've said to you the same thing. I've talked about how structured or how, in a positive sense, how formulaic each of these seven letters is. Haven't I talked to you about how they all contain certain things? You remember this? They all contain praise of the congregation from, the, from, from Christ. They all, do you remember I said to you that they all end in the, all the letters end in the same way, don't they? A promise to those who to, the, to those who persevere, to those who conquer. But did I not also say something about how they all begin? How, does, how do all of these letters begin? There was that picture of the Son of Man in Revelation chapter 1, wasn't there? Remember that? We, we looked at that together. It was this exalted picture, intricate picture of the Son of Man in Revelation 1. And each of these letters harks back to that glorious picture, don't they? Each of these letters contain elements of that picture of the Son of Man, and Jesus picks certain elements and delivers those elements to the churches. Isn't that right? So what do you want to know? Which elements of this beautiful picture of the Son of Man, which elements does he send to Philadelphia? Have a look. Come on, let's look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. So Christ, yes, he, he's, he's, he reminds them, this letter, the, the words of the Holy One, the true one, the one who is set apart, the one who has truthfulness, and that's beautiful, great, fine. It's the next detail that should grab you by the collar. Do you see it? That just as in chapter one, Christ says that he has got keys, 
So he says this in chapter one, he says he's got keys in his hand, but unlike chapter one, these are not the keys of death, these are not the keys of Hades, look at what he says, read it with me. So Christ speaks of himself as the one with the keys of David, who opens and no one will shut, and shuts and no one will open. Now this is going to test who's listening and who's not. This will test who's awake and who is not awake. So I'm asking, does that ring a bell? I'll read it again. Does it ring a bell? <laughs> Already one or two raised eyebrows. I'll read it again. He is the one, Christ is the one with the key of David who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open. Does that ring a bell for us? It should do. Because what did we read in our first reading? We learned of a man called Eliakim. Adrian came up and read of Eliakim. What was said of Eliakim? God promised to establish Eliakim, wait for it, as the gatekeeper to the house of David. So that was what we read in Isaiah chapter 2. So Eliakim was going to be installed as the administrator of the royal Davidic house. Did you get the idea or not? Eliakim was the guy who was controlling who gets to come into the Davidic household and who comes, comes out. Who gets to go in and who comes out. And what did we read? We all know the answer to this, but what do we read in Isaiah 22, verse 22 of Eliakim? What do we read? Listen, we read this. Eliakim, he will be given the key to the house of David. He shall open and no one will shut, and he will shut and no one will open. Do you not see what the Lord Jesus Christ is doing? to encourage these people in Philadelphia. He's pointing them to himself and to his glory. Isn't that right? He is saying to them for their encouragement, I am the Lord Christ, the ultimate Eliakim. Christ saying, I am the administrator of the royal divine household. Christ saying that he is the only one who can permit entrance into the kingdom of God. And maybe it is tonight that you're down as a believer, are you? Maybe it is that you're in a quagmire, spiritually struggling. Well, don't you see what you've got there? That there is the best remedy of all for your soul. Like, where do you look truly, Christian friend, to be invigorated? Where? What do you need to do to be enlivened? You need to refocus your whole life on Jesus Christ. Like you need to cast yourself back, your mind back, your heart back to Jesus. Start in even tonight to go home to read those portions of Scripture that confront you with His glory, confront you with His splendor, His nature, and confront you with the fact that He, uh, he alone is the sovereign over salvation. Because isn't it true? There is nothing more encouraging for the people of God in all of this world than for us to remember this that the one in the end who will ultimately determine who enters through that door is the Lord Jesus Christ. He opens the door of salvation and he alone. So Christ reminds us of the administrator of salvation. Second of all, for our encouragement, for the encourage, encouragement of the Philadelphians, Christ also reminds us of the certainty of our salvation. The certainty of our salvation. Here, we come to some controversy. Okay? But that's okay. Because I know we like a bit of drama. Don't we? We like a little bit of controversy. So it's fine. So what is the controversy here? Well, have a look with me, please, at verse 8. So again, Christ speaks of an open door. But he speaks of setting before the Philadelphians sets before the Philadelphians an open door. So what's the controversy? Well, you really have two groups of interpretations, right? You have, even within reform circles, you have two views on verse 8 and what that open door might be. 
So can I explain it to you really briefly? First of all, here's the majority position, okay? So most people think that what you've got in verse 8 is the promise of evangelistic success. So did you see the idea? Like to encourage the Philadelphian believers who have little power is as though Christ says, I'm putting before you an open door of gospel opportunity. Can't fail. Opportunity. Door of opportunity, of gospel opportunity and witnessing. Now, I have to stand here and say that that might be right. This is John writing, isn't it? And it's not Paul. And I think that's important. But what does Paul do other places in Scripture? Paul does talk about there's been a door open for me, a door of opportunity for gospel witness. Do you see it? So it might be right. But actually, I'm not convinced it is. See, I wonder if you agree with me that it seems highly unlikely that the Lord Jesus would use the image of a door in one verse to mean one thing, and in the very next verse, use the same image of a door to speak about something else. Do do you follow what I'm saying? Like, isn't it strange that in in verse 7, Jesus, we talk about the open door of salvation, of eternal life, only in verse 8, to talk about an open door of witnessing? speaking to people. You see, and actually, if we give Christ more credit and it's a consistent image, do you not see what he's saying to the Philadelphians when he says that he is putting an open door before them? Do you see what he's doing? The Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation 3 is actually, I think, assuring them of the certainty of their salvation. Do you see it? Verse 7 saying, I am and only me. I am the only one who can open that door. But then you go into verse 8, and he's saying, and I've done it for you. I've opened the door for, for you, assuring them of the... Like, think of it. To a group of people who have had the synagogue door closed in their face by the Jews in Philadelphia, now Jesus Christ in verse 8, he, he says, assures them of eternal life, assures them, no, nah, okay, that might be the case. But the door to the kingdom of God for you, it is, it is open and open wide. Now, I, I, come on, I don't know about you, but surely, oh, I mean, for me, that is encouraging because what do we know in here? Same thing's true of you. Same thing is, is true of me. That there is for us in Christ Jesus today, there can be, there is certainty of our salvation. And, and, and how can I say that? It goes back to that limited atonement stuff that we looked at last year. Because you know what we're like by our sin. We always, our default position is to try and make salvation about us. Isn't it? It was always about, oh, well, am I saved or not? I don't know if I feel that way. Or, you know, it's, oh, is my faith is it coming and going. We make it about us. But what does the Bible actually tell us? What's actually true? Salvation is not dependent upon our feelings. Salvation is not dependent upon the performance of our faith or the strength of our faith. What is it dependent on? On what Christ Jesus has already achieved for us. He's opened the door for us in Christ. I, again, I, I can say to you, I've said it to you before, but in a very real sense, if you're in Christ Jesus tonight, your salvation was secured over 2,000 years ago on a hill outside Jerusalem, and there is nothing that anyone can do about it. Isn't it encouraging for us? Not only is Jesus the one and the only one who can open the door to the kingdom of God, but for us in Christ, what has he done? He has opened that door and opened it for you. And then the last thing, so we've seen that Christ reminds us of the administrator of salvation. It's He's the sovereign of salvation. Then he reminds us of the certainty of our salvation. And then lastly, Christ reminds us of the permanence of salvation. And this is predictable. You know what I'm going to do next, do you? As I've done in every single one of these sermons, we have to end with the promise that Christ gives to those who conquer and those who persevere. But I want to get there in a different way because I want to get to that promise that Christ gives us by speaking about Gabriel. (laughs) I do. 
uh, not the angel Gabriel, <laughs> but I want to speak to you about the big bruising uh, Brazilian elder, uh, Mr. Amarim. And I did warn him. So yes, he'll be embarrassed, but, but, but who cares? A couple of weeks ago, Mr. Amarim, he got permanent residency in this country. I'm right, aren't I? So you got, what was it called? Indefinite leave to remain. Now we can imagine what that would have been like because he doesn't go on about it, but there would have been quite a lot of insecurity, yeah, for Gabriel over the last number of years. Because the reality is for Gabriel to stay here with his family and so forth, he has needed um, a sponsor uh, for to be able to work, to have employment in this country. And then all of a sudden, a couple of weeks ago, it changes. And all of a sudden, Gabriel um, has fixed residency, fixed permanent residency in this country. So it does look as though we are stuck uh, with Gabriel. Okay, we're stuck with Gabriel. Now, bear that in mind. Keep it in mind. Now, look at the text. Look at verse 10. Like, what is it that that Christ promises us. So here, what does he promise those who persevere? In verse 10, you, we could linger on the fact that he promises to protect the Philadelphians and protect us from this age of increasing tribulation. Spiritually, we are protected. And that's great. I, mean, I, I, I absolutely could linger on that. But I want to go for what is even more spectacular. And I want to suggest this, that actually what Jesus promises us who persevere is fixed residency in the kingdom of God. Now, do you see the nuance? Do you see the difference? Christ Jesus is not just promising the Philadelphians and, and those who conquer. He is not just promising that they will go through the door of salvation. Christ Jesus is promising them and us that we stay that we have fixed residency. Now, that's my suggestion. That's what I'm suggesting, Christ is saying. Let's see how, how he says it. A couple of things. First of all, look at verse 12 with me, please. Do you see what he calls us? To those who conquer, I will make, look at the next bit, I will make a pillar. I'm going to make you a pillar in the temple of God. Now, uh, what function? What's he talking about? What function does a pillar play? We could ask Letitia as our re resident architect about this. We could say a pillar gives an architect opportunity to show off. Doesn't a pillar do that? You know, maybe one of these Corinthian columns, a little elaborate, you know, flourish at the top of it. We could, that's a pillar. But that's not the main point of a pillar. Look at these things. Look at these brute pillars. What would happen if we did away with those pillars tonight? Come on, look at it. What, the Anglicans tomorrow morning? <laughs> not going to be happy. Why? Because all of this is coming down. Isn't it? You do away with those pillars. This all comes crashing down. Do you see the promise from Christ Jesus? Us as pillars. Do you see it? He's promised us permanence in the kingdom of God. Surely saying to us, if we persevere in him, Christian friend, listen, he promises us that we are part of the integral structure of the kingdom of God. You in Christ, to God, part of the integral structure of his kingdom. <laughs> so he says it like that. He shows us we're permanent that way. But then we just got to get to the other side of it. Because do this for me. Please keep on reading in verse 12. You keep on reading. Do you see the next part of the promise? He speaks of us receiving names. Do you see how there's quite a lot of names that we receive? The name of God comes to those who persevere. The name of the city of God comes to those who persevere. The new name of Jesus, and that name, Revelation 19, the King of kings and Lord of lords. What, did you see what he's saying to us? Do you? Just as with Gabriel. In his ceremony, his residence ceremony that he had a couple of weeks ago, just as there, in his documents, they would have been given a stamp of approval in the name of the queen. What is Christ reminding us of? What is he showing us? He's reminding us what lies ahead. That day, where is the confirmation of our citizenship? There is a day ahead of us when we are going to be stamped with the name 
of our King, our monarch, the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, isn't it, don't you think, isn't it so uplifting and encouraging? What do you have in Christ? You have heavenly, indefinite leave to remain. You have fixed residency in heaven, all by the blood of the Lamb. And then I, I end, and I have to end, with a warning. You see, have one glance at verse 7, if you would. I, I've lingered in verse 7 and, and said that Jesus Christ is the one and the only one with the power to open the door of salvation. But that is not all verse 7 says. Because in verse 7, we learn that Christ Jesus has the power to close the door of salvation so that it will never be opened again. And so I I want to speak to you, if you're not professing faith tonight, if you're not in Christ Jesus this evening, and I, I want to ask you to do two things as you go out of this church and as you make your way home, two things, I want you to consider that reality for yourself. In God's inerrant word tonight, you are hearing there will be a time where the door to salvation closes for you. Doesn't that make you shudder? Like the opportunity you have to look to Christ in repentance and faith, one day that, oppor- that door of opportunity slams shut. I want to ask you to do that. The second thing I would urge you to do is to seize the day. Seize this opportunity you have right now. You, like me, you, like everyone in this room, we are sinners. We are flawed. You need Christ Jesus. We not seize this opportunity tonight and repent of your sin and believe in him. Because surely you look at the Christians in your life and you see this, that there is no greater joy than fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me, let me, let me, Personally, let me say that. There, you know, to know the Lord Jesus Christ in a saving way, what is it? All the Christians would affirm. To know Christ is the greatest encouragement of all. Friends, let's pray.